thanks david um yeah so thanks a lot for coming along hopefully we can uh, present some new and interesting material and, and view ifc and, and open beam perhaps in a new light or uh, or uh, yeah, as part of this sort of presentation so um, I'm going to talk a lot about particularly model authoring for asset information um, managing. And for those that don't know me, I sort of describe myself as a hybrid. So I studied a double degree in structural engineering and computer science here at the University of Melbourne. I, uh, I worked as a structural engineer for about 10 years. And then I worked, uh, well, in that process, I was developing a lot of scripts and spreadsheets that helped me do my job. And then I eventually turned on to sort of full-time tool development, mainly in the form of plugins to permit, to permit um, interoperability and enable that, that you can sort of exchange these models. And IFC has certainly been a key part of enabling interoperability with the tools that I've been developing. So if we started to address a question about what is BIM or what is open BIM even, um, and I'm not gonna provide an answer, but if you sort of Google and get some images, you get some things that look like this. And this network of tools and processes and, and tasks, et cetera, is only gonna get more complex and in my opinion, we're only going to get smaller and sharper and more specific software tools. So this graph's going to grow rather than sort of one big aggregate of a jack of all um, trades tool that does everything. And then what becomes really important when we have so many tools and processes is how we exchange the data and information between them. And this is where IFC plays its role in an in a open framework and model schema that allows those exchanges to take place. So. I'm going to start with just a couple of observations and one, authoring IFC isn't trivial, there's not too many people that would say your IFC is simple, but the key part that I'd like to add to that is actually I, producing IFC should not be a burden. So if you're working with your software tools and you're finding it really difficult to, to create IFC or use, import IFC or reference it, then I think the key point is then make lots of complaints as David mentioned. So software vendors are businesses, they'll respect, react to market forces. If you're not complaining about the um, ability of that software with OpenBIM, there's not much that's gonna happen with it. And there are key reasons for using open standards. They will motivate innovation and improvement and foster market competition. So the opposite is a silo or a monopoly with a proprietary file format, um, which is not particularly, monopolies aren't particularly good things for the, the clients that use them. They're particularly good for the company that has the monopoly. Um, a couple of you guys might be fairly familiar with this type of process, but um, again, I mean, I guess we're concentrating a lot today about BIM for design transfer, how we actually, to traditionally IFC has been used for coordination, and if you see certification of IFC software, there, there, there's a schema of, of, of mo what a model is capable of exchanging, and then to use it for coordination purpose, it only really requires a small subset of that schema to be used. And for that purpose, if we're just gonna do clash detection, if we're gonna reference models, we actually don't need a really sophisticated model to do that. We can either, and typically these things are extrusions, so a profile shape which is swept along a straight axis, or if it gets any more complicated than that, then it typically it gets meshed and you end up with this faceted brep or polysurface object. And then those that then, again, for, for coordination that's fine, but there's some good examples of infrastructure projects where the civil superstructure might be done in EchoSim, but station design might be done in, in Revit or Archicad or, or other um, more building oriented software. And then of course, particularly the, the designers don't like to see this type of uh, representation in their models. There's a discussion to be had about whether Revit could actually mask those internal edges, but, but by the same token, I've been doing some work to one, reverse engineer these things. So a routine that can actually identify the extrusion path and even calculate cut shapes at the edges of them. But more importantly, as I said, reverse engineering is not ideal either. We could actually put more pressure on the software that's authoring those files to produce a high quality model that could be used for that particular purpose. Um, I'm just gonna give an acknowledgement and, an, a, a, and plug the uh, Transport for New South Wales industry briefing that's happening next Wednesday in Sydney. Um, I've been doing a small role lately consulting to Transport for New South Wales and they've been kind enough to give me permission to talk about some of that today. Um, and again, I only know a small fraction of this with the, particularly with the, the model authoring and digital twin, but this is a, an event where the, um, Transport for New South Wales themselves will be making some announcements and giving more explanations about what they're doing. And they have a medium to long term strategy as well as a short term inter interim strategy that's taking, that's basically in starting to be uh, announced and, and planned and used in the near future. So I'm very much only going to be concentrating on the digital twin. The digital twin concept is, is becoming more prevalent um, by the day, I think. 
and the idea that we have a physical asset but we build a digital asset first and then we make we we can try options we can test scenarios we can we can validate there and it's a lot cheaper to make a mistake or, or identify a problem in a digital model than the physical one so um, that, that's certainly where that particularly becomes important, not just through d design, but through operations and maintenance as well. Um, I'm going to talk just quickly a little bit about Kobe. So anyone that hasn't seen Kobe before, Kobe is again like a model view definition of IFC, a subset, a list of required properties that, that um, can be supplied and used to op uh, um, maintain and operate a, a facility or an asset. And it stands for construction owner builder uh, or building information exchange. So I don't think anyone would argue that the built environment doesn't need structured data to be efficiently operated and maintained. Again, I guess there's this transition. We're not, we're not really doing new things, but we're moving from paper-based analog type um, storage and, and use of data to actually exchanging it digitally. Um, and again, I mean, if you talk to people about Kobe, you can certainly quickly find plenty of detractors. Part of that reason is because popular authoring tools don't have implementation to the required concepts for Kobe, and partly because a lot of the tool provision around that is, is still reasonably primitive, unfortunately. I think in terms of Kobe, and I'm going to use a lot of Revit um, examples and dominant terms. If I say Revit, you can exchange that for EchoSim or Archicad or um, any art authoring tool that you might have, uh, um, Civil 3D, 12D, whatever else it might be. But I think in, in a Revit sense, if, if users were provided with a list of shared parameters, they'd actually be quite happy with that um, as, as a way of actually then looking at a model and saying, well, what's the data I need to include in that? I'm going to look in a second a bit about how we can load that data into Revit. And the reality is it's actually not that different. So here we've got an IFC XML file, which is just a, 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 within an IF, a example of an IFC property template where we can list the sets and the individual properties that exist within that, that, that required data set. If you ask people what Kobe is, most people will tell you it's a spreadsheet. And I think what's actually really quite interesting, I mean, again, I, again, I'm not an expert in asset maintenance and things like that, but I believe spreadsheets are pretty prevalent and pretty popular, of course, across the whole industry as a way of managing data and collecting data and, and authoring data. So I think it's also good in, in what we're going to see, you know, a low tech solution that doesn't require expensive tools and things like that. It just requires a spreadsheet with a certain structure to it that is, 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 is easily edited and, and managed, etc. Now, transport for New South Wales are not going to be uh, mandating or requiring Kobe as a deliverable. Um, there's a few aspects of Kobe, again, because even like IFC, it's born out of particularly the building industry. There are a few aspects of it that don't necessarily lend itself so well to being used in asset maintenance and operation for an infrastructure project. So what they've been prototyping, and this will be part of their launch and, 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 um, and requirements, etc., is their own spreadsheet, which we're going to have a quick look at. I'm going to try and show some stuff live, which is um, a, a equivalent to a Kobe spreadsheet. And again, I guess transport for New South Wales don't want to overwhelm industry. By the same token, they don't want to stifle industry. And so what I think is really clever about this strategy is you start to get a hybrid approach where you can look at authoring data um, in a spreadsheet, authoring data in a model, as well as um, combining the two into a, in a, into a common data set. So if I was going to do a concept um, design for um, a Sydney light rail, um, then I might actually add a, a station or start to outline that I've got a station at Circular Quay, I might have a station at Bridge Street, I might have a station at Town Hall, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think what's been enlightening as well, and I, I don't know how many of you have seen Simon Vaux's presentation on Transport for New South Wales, they invested quite a lot of effort into researching classification and I think what's even opened my eyes up a lot is there's a perception, and I had this perception, I guess, IFC really isn't applicable to infrastructure projects. But what becomes really interesting is, if, uh, particularly from a classification perspective, because <laughs> concepts for bridge and, uh, and rail and roads and things like that in terms of a classification sense aren't there. But if we actually couple um, IFC up with a classification system like Uniclass, then we actually start to get a, um, a, a pretty powerful partnership and you can actually use IFC 2x3 with agreed conventions about how to define assets within IFC 2x3. I've been doing a little bit of tooling in this so that actually if I actually want to start adding classification here into a spreadsheet is that then you can actually look it up in a, con in a, in a, in a context menu and in a spatial sense of an infrastructure project Uniclass works in particular with having complexes, entities, and then spaces and locations as a breakdown. So you'll see that the first row that I had in this spreadsheet here was that there was a Sydney light rail complex, 
And then if I want to classify that this object within this system is a, is a station, is that then, I'm not sure how big the font is, but if I then browse down in through into entities under transport entities, under railway entities, and then look, I can see I can find a railway station concept. So instead of requiring an IFC railway station of, um, a class within the IFC framework, I can actually use classification as a way of identifying what that object is. And then the, the, the information requirements <coughs> at, at, at such a primitive conceptual level are actually pretty simple, but they're just requiring some project IDs um, as a way of sort of saying, well, or identifying what this model is. Of course, this sort of gets submitted to, um, to Transport for New South Wales, and if it gets approved in a real thing, um, it would actually then have a, its own unique identifier assigned to it. Now, so what we've also then been doing and prototyping is a Transport for New South Wales Excel plugin to actually export this model to IFC or to import and append this model with other data from a model or merge to IFC. And I'm going to have a quick look at that as a concept in a second as part of this demo. So if I, here's one I prepared earlier, um, although it's still, again, not particularly comp um, comprehensive or complex. But again, so this starts to break down the, the, the spatial arrangement a little bit further. So if you can have single-sided platforms or double-sided platforms as, as spaces. If you go through that, there's a whole bunch of stuff for highways, ro or motorways, drainage, stormwater, um, all sorts of other things that might or might not be in the IFC 2x3 classification. Of course, I could go down and list all the other stations and actually outline their um, sub, sub, um, sub spaces within them. And then if we actually start to look at the assets themselves, um, and particularly from an infrastructure sense, we might want to establish what the systems are that exist within that particular um, that particular infrastructure asset. So I've set up here some base systems. I've got some furniture systems for benches on platform one and two. I've set up a signage system for um, platform one and two and a canopy system for one and two. And you can see the classification codes that have been entered there as a way of identifying that. And then the project asset ID, which has been assigned here on that, um, on that Excel row as part of that. I'm not sure Transport for New South Wales is going to employ me as a station designer, but um, just to test this process as the hybrid between uh, Excel and an authoring tool such as Revit, and remember you can swap Revit out with other applications, and if we click on some of these objects that I've started to place here, um, then what we'll see, particularly if I undo and go back one step, is that the information requirements at such an early stage are still pretty primitive. And I guess one of the criticisms you can make of Revit is that it has a implementations for systems for MEP and services, but it's not really possible to have systems that relate to furniture or um, um, other sort of um, natures that you might have within a, an infrastructure asset. So but what we can do then is actually just associate what system owns that asset by using a simple text parameter here in the, on, the, on the object. And then what I also think is important is actually using, we don't want to have duplicate places for putting the same information. So if Revit already has a built-in parameter for a mark, and we want to use that for the Transport for New South Wales project ID, then what we will do is this mapping process. So when we export that to IFC, is that we get that parameter or property appear in the right location when we author that as an exchange. The other thing, other thing they've been loading uh, or, or working on to, to help assist this process is the ability to load property templates into, uh, into families that are existing. So the information requirements will become more sophisticated and longer as we extend through the different phases of, de of project design. And so there's a little tool here which you can then say, well, here's my IFC XML file, which is defining those transport for New South Wales um, information requirements. If we scroll down, we'll see there's like a status parameter or property. We can have like a change property for where a linear infrastructure about how to locate it. And we can have, um, uh, you know, again, not a comprehensive list. We might have asset specific um, pro parameters or properties as well. So if it's a canopy, it might have a different set of properties required than if it's a, a track or a, a bench. But the idea then being is this tool can actually go through, identify what everything's classified as, and then actually start to load the specific require, the parameters required to that into each of those families. And that means if you click on a bench and it has different property requirements to a track, then you don't actually end up with all the track parameters listed under that object and then try and work out what you should and shouldn't supply in any particular object. What's also I want to feed into this is actually the properties that I don't want it to include in this. So if I've already said as a, uh, you know, the project asset ID I'm going to use as mark, I'm going to tell it don't make that property for me or parameter for me, uh, and, and some of these other sorts of um, um, properties that, that might be 
using built-in or, or um, proprietary provided properties that already exist in that model. Again, because I don't want someone filling in the value in the wrong space because the provision was made there for it to be um, placed in two locations. So if I click on an object like the totem pole now, you will see that this list of properties has expanded and that means then I could actually go through and start to enter the data in the model if that's what I wanted to do as part of this process. I'm not going to export this to IFC just in the interest of a, of a short presentation, but what I do want to do is actually start to quickly show um, how we can then say merge the spatial hierarchy of this with the and the system hierarchy of this with the IFC that is generated from Revit. So if I click on I want to merge the spreadsheet data to the, to the Revit generated IFC, and again it's just literally um, out of the box Revit exporter, you can just customize what the actual um, properties are that you need to map or have included in the export. So if I pick the, the Revit file, which is the, this one here, and then what it's going to do is also morph the spatial arrangement in the resulting file so that actually we get, if, if we browse it in a second, we'll see that we get that spatial breakdown and system breakdown. So if I quickly go find that folder, and then I find the file that I just created. This is a, if you're ever looking to and try and interrogate IFC and you think this tool is useful, this is actually a, a free one that I um, author and, and supply. And if we start to break down the IFC project, IFC is really like a relational database and we have the spatial breakdown where we have effectively my, um, the, this entity here is, it's, it's known as, it's, because I'm using IFC 2x3, it says it's an IFC building. But what we're really doing is, again, using that classification reference to say it's a light rail complex. And we, we'd have to have the classification override what the IFC class actually meant in our downstream processes. But so we have Bridge, rail, Bridge Street Light Rail Station, which is broken down into two platforms, which then has um, a number of benches and signs and, um, and canopies. So you can break the model down that way. We can also see that any space actually has um, the, the systems that I was associating before. So I've got my furniture signage and platform sy system. And then you can also interrogate this model through the classification references. So if I scroll down to the bottom here and I want to know, well, what are all the um, stations that I have here within the, within the complex, uh, the system? I think it's this one here for some reason doesn't actually say, well, there's the platforms. If I expand out what is under shelter structures, we, you know, and again, you could trans tra traverse through your entire network to try and um, do by classification identify what the things are. The the other thing that you can do is round trip that, as I said. So the idea is that if we come back to our spreadsheet here, maybe I'll just delete this data that I added here, and then I say import IFC, is that actually then we would get that new the, in, the entire aggregated model that which actually then is round tripped into its own spreadsheet. So the idea is you can author the data in multiple environments. Um, w depending on whether how sophisticated or unsophisticated or how high tech or low tech a solution that you might or might not want to apply to this type of uh, approach. If you didn't understand all that, I'll try and summarize it a little bit and it's, it, this is really an introduction, not necessarily a, a training course in how to do this. I'm going to just quickly talk as a lead in a little bit to uh, Peter's presentation and about how you actually prepare a work plan without someone sitting in and actually trying to manually type in task IDs and things like that. And Peter gave me three rules about actually for a, a sample model from BIM MP, I think Brendan Upton um, supplied this for the BIM MPP Oz um, conference recently. Um, and here we have just a network of ducting with some air terminals and some, um, um, some air handling units, etc. And what Peter gave me was three rules to try and produce a work plan so that we know what task needs to be done before other tasks can be started. And the first rule was that a duct segment is installed first and foremost, and we have to allow for a duration of three hours to install that air duct. If we have a, a, a adjacent duct fittings, they can only be installed after the duct segments, any attached duct segments have been installed, and we allow two hours to install them. And then finally, a, a, ducting, a duct segment can only have a wrapping or insulation or covering applied to it after the adjacent fittings have been applied. And so, again, rather than, again, if you actually export IFC natively out of Revit, it already has a bunch of um, uh, associations and, and relationships established with this. So if we click on a flow segment, which is a duct segment, we know what the covering is and we can know what it's connected to in terms of flow fittings. And so what I did then to try and help Peter automatically calculate this is create a grasshopper script, which it really just creates a filter. So it just says, give me all the duct segments and then tell me what are all the fittings that are attached to each segment 
and then set up a sequence relationship, which Peter can zoom in on a little bit later on, and then actually tell me all the associated coverings and, and sequence them that they can only be installed after that. And then we, I, I wrote that back out as a new IFC file with the work plan, um, which I gave to Peter, which he's going to talk about a little bit later on. So I guess if what I said didn't make a lot of sense, there will be a bit more detail to come about this in some slightly longer sessions, I, sug I suspect. But the, the key two points I guess I'd like to make. If sophisticated open BIM can be authored from Excel um, in combination with any auth IFC authoring application, then we can have low-tech and high-tech solutions with how we approach these types of modeling. Um, and it, so the key is that you know it's not all about trying to use sophisticated um, um, BIM tools as part of this. We can still do a lot of modeling in Excel, which I think could be pretty convenient and particularly helpful to the parts of industry that aren't so necessarily so tech savvy. And I think the other thing, as I said, that really became an eye-opener with the Transport for New South Wales stuff was that if we couple IFC 2x3 with a classification such as Uniclass, that means we can use IFC on infrastructure projects today. There's still some very important stuff to come in IFC 5, particularly if we want to um, define alignment curves and particular parts of bridges and stuff like that. But in terms of plant equipment and, and even highways and things like that, there is a lot, that, and particularly the, the you know the, the asset, the, the servicing assets. Um, then there is a lot that we can do today without waiting for IFC five. So, thanks a lot for your time. Hopefully that gives you um, some insights. In, and I think the transport for New South Wales stuff is, is pretty exciting. I also sort of expect other agencies and other governments to follow suit. I don't expect them all s to spend the same amount of money and effort that transport for New South Wales have done. So I think it's really interesting to, to see how this plays out. But uh, any questions now, well, my contact details are also up there if you want to contact me as a follow-up. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, any questions for John? Easy, isn't it? <laughs> Dan? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Great question. So, and some of that tooling was my own, but the, the, um, but the, the import and export from the Transport for New South Wales spreadsheet to IFC, I don't think there's a firm decision made yet, but I suspect that will be open sourced. And that will also allow others to build their own bespoke versions of it, as well as you know, have, you know, be able to tinker with it and fix it and, and improve it. So um, that's what I'm expecting, but you, I, you know, that, I don't think a firm decision's been made on that yet. Great, yeah. So again, I mean, I've been doing some testing on this for um, for Building Smart International, um, and it, it really does work quite well. So I can show another thing. I've been testing an, on a Swedish road um, or a drainage system. I guess no road one. Where's the road one? But again, maybe I can give. Um, but again, you can have like a motorway which is broken down into corridors as well as a nation which is broken down into states, which is broken down into cancels, which is then a junction which is attached to two motorway things and things like that. It, it is real, uh, you know, I've been to here, this is the one I'm thinking about. Um, if, if, we, if we look at this file, and again, I know this isn't, it, it's easy for me to look at this and maybe not you guys so much, but we can actually say Sweden is a country which is decomposed into um, different effectively admin regions, which I think are like their states, which is broken down into um, counties or um, councils or whatever. But then we can also have uh, like um, motorways which are, are broken. So if I go down under external information, that we can actually have um, have motorways which are broken down into, into sections which are, then have junctions and, and, and all sorts of associations like that. So on the spot, sorry, I'm, well here's a motorway and that motorway is associated with or is known as it runs through particular councils or particular states. You can have this multiple um, object hierarchy to capture and still, you know, this normally it's still the physical location. If you're going to tell someone to go out and fix a, a, a storm um, drain at a certain location, but you, you can, it really still, even within IFC 2x3, still allows you to break down from what I'm seeing. It would be interesting, I guess, to also test this more thoroughly locally with how the local agencies or, or um, road um, asset managers actually do manage this type of um, hierarchy. But but the work I'm doing so far, it actually looks pretty capable, even within IFC 2x3. Does that does that make sense? Sorry, I know I've fumbled oh, yeah, through that a bit. But that data, 
Yeah, and it, it, it will. And it, this, this actually doesn't have any individual assets in it, but you still have like a, a, a G, GIS or a, a way of coordinate referencing how to find something as well as how to spatially locate it within a network. Any other